Well, just over 1% of the 13 million vehicles in this country are run on natural gas. Most of these in large fleets owned by industry and municipalities. Yet a growing number of individuals, albeit a small number, are making the switch to the cleaner burning fuel. When it comes to solving our country's dependence on foreign oil, there's been no shortage of suggestions. Wind turbines, nuclear energy, solar bank, energy efficient windows, energy efficient home, hydro, American coal, solar power, ethanol, not just from corn, atomic power, wood chips and stalks or switch grass. Most viable, but all far from reality. Unlike natural gas, that is both abundant and increasingly available. I've had my CNG car for about a year and a half now. I absolutely love it, haven't had any problems. Um, it's great for the environment, and I pay $1.39 a gallon. And not only less than half the price of gasoline, but also a much cleaner burning fuel. I've been, had my CNG for about a year and a half, and um, it's great, I love it. It cost me about $8 to fill up and last me the entire week. So on average, I'm spending about $8 a week on, on uh, natural gas to get around. You know, everyone asks me about my car, and they, they ask and they, they, they say, you know, how much does it cost you to fill up? And, you know, I'm like, oh, it's like $1.39 as opposed to 4 on their end. So if CNG is both cheaper and better for the environment, what's the holdup? Well, that comes down to just one word, infrastructure. Which was much of the talk at the 6th Annual Energy Conference sponsored by Oklahoma State University. With natural gas prices their lowest in a decade, industry officials agree their largest challenge right now is surviving the glut of natural gas now in the market. And hardest hit, Chesapeake Energy. Stock prices have dropped more than 18% since mid-April for the Oklahoma City-based company when Reuters reported CEO Aubrey McClendon secured up to $1.1 billion in loans by using his stake in the company as collateral. Now, I was able to sit down with the Chesapeake CEO, whose own fortunes have been tied as well as those of his company to the ups and downs of natural gas exploration. Aubrey, with the price of natural gas at a 10-year low, is your industry, is it a victim of its own success? Fair question, and I guess a little bit. I mean, really, today, we're a victim of the warmest winter in 100 years, and that's taken about 4% of all year-long natural gas demand off the market. So I think, really, today, we'd have gas prices between 3 and 4 rather than around $2 a day. So, we now have this surplus that we didn't burn this winter. We've got to work it off this summer. So I think 2012 will be a pretty tough year for gas prices. Be great for consumers. Uh, be great for uh, burning into uh, people's minds the view that natural gas is abundant and it's affordable. Um, but there has to be some return to the producer. And right now at two dollars, there's not that return. But so you know, I think in the next uh, year or two, we'll certainly see a return to prices that are going to be more acceptable. They'll still be great for consumers, but good for uh, producers as well. So are you frustrated that we're not using more natural gas? Oh, well, sure. I, right now, I wish there was some magic new industry that could sop up all this uh, excess supply from this winter. But actually, what you have to do to increase demand is you have to increase supply first. I can never convince you to go build a new power plant to burn natural gas if I didn't have you convinced there would be more natural gas for you to burn. So we've now taken the last five years and fully established that American natural gas is abundant and affordable. And now um, we're in a phase where the demand kicks off. And it's not just that we have a better product from an environmental perspective. Um, it's not just we have a product that's domestically made rather than internationally um, made. It's now about one-tenth the cost of oil. And so whenever you have substitutive, substitutive products, you're going to see the switch made. And so that's all happening. It's going to play out for the rest of my life, the rest of your life. It will accelerate here over the next couple of years as a result of this peculiar situation when we have $2 natural gas and $100 oil, that's the equivalent of $12 oil on the natural gas side and $100 uh, on, the, on the oil side. So could American natural gas, could it revitalize other American industries, say like manufacturing? 
It's already happening. Um, today, if you look at manufacturing employment in the U.S., it's continuing to go up. If you listen to the CEOs of companies like U.S. Steel, of uh, Dow, DuPont, all of these gentlemen are saying they're moving business back to the U.S., they're hiring, they're expanding, they're growing, they're making record profits. And as a consequence of which we now see an industrial renaissance in the U.S. beginning to take shape. And we haven't seen this. I mean, we, we've been deindustrializing America for the last 40 years. And so it's not going to turn around overnight. Uh, but this is a very, very important new trend in our economy. And, and by the way, there's an, another factor as well, which is if you're manufacturing something made for the American market in China uh, today, what are you faced with? Well, you're faced with rising costs in China, but you're also faced with rising transportation costs as well because it takes oil to move your product from China to here. So I think there's going to be lots of um, reasons why you see a surprising uptick in the manufacturing aspect of the U.S. economy when it was part of the economy that people had just written off and said, you know, we're just not going to bend metal anymore. And the reality is we are, and we're going to do it smarter, but we can do it cheaper uh, than other countries around the world as well. Could the current debate over hydraulic fracking, could it threaten that future you've just been talking about? Oh, I guess, you know, theoretically it could, Rob, but um, the reality is when you dig down in the facts, somewhere between 90 and almost 100 percent of North American natural gas comes from a well that's been fracked, whether it was drilled 20 years ago or 10 years ago or, or last year. And so basically that argument about hydro fracturing is really about whether or not you're going to have natural gas or not. Because if you say, I'm against that, then it means you're for coal, you're for oil. So you can't really be against hydrofracking and say you're an environmentalist because immediately the default options are fuels that are much less clean um, than natural gas is. And you also basically are going to come out and say, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm against food because uh, all fertilizer is made from natural gas. And I'm against home heating and office heating and uh, electricity. 35% of American electricity comes from natural gas. So it's an argument that, uh, or a debate that gets a lot of ink, um, but in terms of any serious threat to the supply of natural gas from it, I don't really see that. It's just frankly a matter of what's the proper level of regulation, what's the proper transparency um, into what we do. And I think we're making strides on, on both those fronts. So I, my, my hope is two or three or four years from now, you'll be well informed about what we do and how we do it. But in terms of it being something that people want to argue about, I think it likely will have passed by. As a country, it seems that we've grown quite accustomed to importing energy into our country. But there's the debate going on right now whether we should export energy out of our country with some of the CNG. I want to get your opinion on that. Sure. Well, it's, it's something we absolutely must be able to do. So let's, let's think about where we are today. We export gasoline, we export diesel, we export corn, we export wheat. So it can't single out natural gas and say somehow it's more important than all of those products and say we can't export that. Uh, I think the second um, notion to remember here is that we already export natural gas. We export uh, almost two billion cubic feet a day to Mexico, um, just around a billion cubic feet a day to Canada. And so we, we already do it in the, through pipelines. Now the question is can we do it in ships? And why that's so important today is you mentioned earlier kind of about the boom and bust. How do you, how do you keep an industry from always booming and busting? Well, um, when prices are high, you have a so-called boom. Well, we have the ability to import natural gas into the country in the form of LNG today. So if prices get too high compared to prices in the world, then we'll import gas and it'll turn, it'll tend to dampen gas prices and preserve demand. On the other hand, in times like today, when there's too much gas in the marketplace, whether there be too many wells drilled or not enough cold weather, we need to be able to balance that market and be able to export gas um, as well. And so I think having a robust you know, two-way export market and import market for natural gas allows us to um, offer much more stability to natural gas pricing for consumers. At the end of the day, that's better for consumers and it's better for us as well.
great insights. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. Well, earlier this week, Chesapeake's largest shareholder, a Memphis-based money management firm, urged Chesapeake Energy to be open to takeover offers. But as we're recording this, company officials have shown no signs of Chesapeake changing hands. In fact, McClendon sent out a company-wide email assuring employees that the company has overcome many challenges in its 23 years. And I quote here, we have faced many challenging times like we face today and have successfully overcome them as well. We'll keep you posted.